We have a forum now at this point. It is 6 o'clock. Call to order. Uh, David, are we ready? Sure. Can you do the call roll, please? Alderman Boyd. Present. Alderman Collins. Present. Commissioner Banton. Present. Moab. Present. Commissioner Bradley. Present. Commissioner Brown. I know it's in uh, Commissioner Peoples. <coughs> Commissioner Reed. Not present. Commissioner Vine. Commissioner Young. Present. Commissioner Strather. Present. Right. With the forum, there are a couple. Uh, first thing we'll do is look at the minutes for January 17th. If you have not had a moment to review them, January 7th. I mean, January 7th. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Any motion for that? Move to approve. Second. It's to move the it. 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 second. It's on the table. Vote, please. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Cummings. Aye. Mr. Banton. Aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Rita Vines. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. Chair Scarlett. Aye. And the uh, motion passes with. Uh, seven eyes and one abstention. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, with that, there are several. First off, let me thank everybody for coming in. This is not our normal meeting day or schedule, uh, but I know it was definitely needed and we were able to meet the calendar accordingly. I know that many have had a schedule change, so we had to make some adjustments on the front end and on the back end to get some things moving. Uh, with that, there are a couple of items or changes to the agenda. Don, can you tell us what we've got? Sir? Well, certainly. Uh, thank you for, for being with us tonight and noticing that we're changing the planning commission from a monthly meeting now to a weekly meeting. <laughs> um, so, so we, uh, we, won't, we thank you for having two monthly meetings in a row a couple of times. Uh, we will meet again and establish our regular meeting schedule in February. Uh, tonight, um, this was the featured item, I would say. It's first on the agenda. Uh, your packets were uh, included it. Um, it's a rezoning request for that. As you see the fine print here, it's been withdrawn by the petitioner. Uh, talk about that for just a second. It's in the Jeff Vandaloo neighborhood. It's really at the corner of Jefferson and Cass, the northwest corner of Jefferson and Cass. <coughs> The northeast corner of Jefferson Camp is the engineering site. This is a corner that the petitioner was requesting a zoning change because they were consolidating some parcels. The parcels that they were consolidating weren't all zoned the same, uh, and having met with the zoning administrator, filled out a petition. I mean, this was a petition from a property owner. Uh, essentially, it's north side regeneration. <coughs> Uh, that owns the property was requesting this. Uh, we uh, met with them uh, early in last week, uh, found out some more things from their application, uh, which we appreciate knowing. Uh, and Cecilia did yeoman's work in researching all the issues and preparing a uh, planning commission report and resolution. Uh, that would be in your packet. We sent it to the applicant. And they asked that we not take it out tonight. First, they were asking that could we table it. Uh, it's one of those things. This is a petition. We have 45 days to look at it. We said no. We're not going to look at it tonight. Uh, uh, we want us not to look at it tonight. We need to withdraw it. They have withdrawn it. Uh, and instead, we <coughs> spend more time looking at the resolution staff report that we wrote and come back. Uh, it's their option to come back. They have to reapply. They'll kick in a new 45-day clock when they reapply. See what price comes through that. Uh, as you can well imagine, it was a north side regeneration area, so it might have attracted quite a bit of discussion and a business tonight. So it's fine. Oops. Playing with my new toy. And Second on the agenda is, and the agenda is, after the first one, relatively short. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do something on the plan. It's 
uh, it's a request from uh, the property owner that's been to the preservation board. This is that situation where uh, most items of the preservation board are final actions and you can appeal the court. Did somebody just join? Yes, this is Mary Reese. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so we're just picking up. We had one item that by applicant's request for rezoning has been pulled. They've withdrawn their petition and will likely be back at a later time. So up now is the Preservation Board review of the demolition of 2205 Lynch Street. Uh, it is 20, 2205 Lynch Street. It is one of those situations where actions of the Preservation Board, uh, one type of action uh, is deemed temporary uh, or preliminary. Uh, for a 30-day period, it gives an applicant a chance to say whether a demolition decision by the Preservation Board uh, is something that they wanted to uh, live with, survive with, or whether they would like to ask the Planning Commission to take up that review. Tonight is simply that statement. We're taking up the review uh, requested by this applicant. Uh, if we choose to take up the review, we do so in the subsequent meetings on just the record of the Preservation Board action. We review that. The Planning Commission has the choice of upholding what the, plan, what the Preservation Board does, uh, changing it in terms of modification or reversing it. That action then gets to be appealed to court if they would like. If we choose not to take it up tonight, we, as they're shortchanging, um, not shortchanging the applicant, because the applicant could then uh, appeal directly to court. So, uh, as we're familiar with this tonight, I'll just do the briefest of giving you an idea of what this is. Uh, you are aware that we certainly got this application or request from, from the applicant's attorney. Uh, we're pretty careful about being conscious that it's on review and not new materials. Um, so we uh, will go and just show you tonight the Preservation Board meeting relevant materials. All of it, that is in your packet. I'm going to go through the Preservation uh, PowerPoint just so you can see what it is. Uh, it is 2205 Lynch Street. Um, this is the, it's the building. It's not a rear of a lot. Uh, it is this lot is identified one in from the corner. Uh, from the Benton Park Local and National Register of Historic District, so the jurisdiction is it's a National Register District, and the request was to demolish it, the local and National Register District. In this old, to give you an idea, the, uh, the fund, oops, it is this is from 1875, so it's in this corner cluster here. So it's, a, it's an old building. Uh, it, these are some pictures from it, uh, from the staff report from March of 2014, April of this year, uh, West Mall. So you see it's a rather compact building. That's the current condition. The request, uh, the hearing at the Preservation Board was October 22nd. Uh, <clears throat> Dan Krasnoff of the Preservation Board staff and Alex Keeling, uh, the representative of the attorney uh, from uh, the applicant, the, uh, all there that night and here tonight. Uh, here's some more pictures. Uh, you can certainly see that it's a compact house, but it has been some damage. Uh, here's the aerial view of, uh, again, it's the one that's one in from the front cross street in the back of the lot. Uh, streetscape is such that uh, you can see it there towards the back, back of the lot. Otherwise, looking around in the street. Again, this is a historic district. Uh, these are items where you've seen our, our <coughs> are uh, right up for you. Uh, we don't make a recommendation to you, per se. So we ask for you to be thinking about uh, the step tonight. Um, and 
have a discussion. With that, is there any discussion from the committee of the side? I'd like to make a comment. So, so you know, uh, some of us received um, material from from uh, Mr. Keeling earlier um, last month, I believe, um, and discussed on whether or not that was uh, proper. My thoughts are, you know, at the end of the day, this is still a uh, resident and citizen um, that's trying to demolish. Um, properly, uh, property, uh, a building on a piece of property that, that she owns. Um, my thoughts is, you know, she's coming to us through this process to try to avoid going to court and avoid those necessary expenses. I know that the Preservation Board has ruled. Uh, my thoughts are, you know, do we have a obligation to the citizen to review this at our board before having to, them having to go, go to court. My thoughts are yes, probably, um, we have that obligation. Um, and that should be taken into consideration whether or not the attorney acted properly or not. Any other comments from I guess I'll just to comment on the tail end of that. Um, you know, I had specifically asked for the ordinance on this. Um, there's nothing in the ordinance that pre prevents um, the petitioner from providing additional information. We just can't consider it. Right. Um, and I, you know, on a, a jury of the court, there's sometimes information given that is instructed not to be considered. So I think, you know, I, I don't see anything in this that directly prevents what happened from happening. I just think we need to be careful in how um, we move forward if we do for people that did get that information. I do know there's a number of us that didn't even receive it. Right. Um, so you know, I, I tend to agree. I think the flip side of that might be the um, one, you know, this has come before the Preservation Board now twice. They've ruled in the way that they've ruled now twice. It's brought to us twice to consider whether or not to take it up. The question for us as it relates to the Preservation Board's actions are do we think that they were thorough and did everything that they were supposed to do to the letter without any new information? I don't know. Perhaps we come to a different conclusion. Perhaps we don't. My concern is we're wasting the residents' time uh, and creating a second step when there is a third step that they could just take now and get some final resolution from the court if we end up just deciding that we agree with the Preservation Board and that they did everything thoroughly and considered all the evidence in that the building division or <clears throat> whomever else took this information into consideration. It's certain that it's historic, that it checked all the boxes, that it can stand for however long it needs to stand. So my thought is in the interest of expediting the residence process that we just suggest it goes to the court where a final resolution can be made. Well, Don, did they have the option of going to court after the preservation order, or did they have to do this step first? Well, can go to court any time. Two things. <clears throat> They have uh, been to the preservation board twice, once over a year ago, and the demolition was denied. Uh, and we were asked to take it up, and we didn't take it up that time. In that intervening year, they did not, to our knowledge, go to court, but we did not go. We had summoned the court because they had gone to court. Uh, a demolition. When you come to the Preservation Board or the Cultural Resources and you get a response, you get a final determination of what happens, uh, you can't turn around the next day and say, we want to demolish again. There's a year's waiting period. So what I'm getting to is they did wait a year. Uh, there was an intervening year. They did not go to court. Uh, and they came back to the Preservation Board uh, in October created a new record in October, uh, and the Preservation Board denied it at that time. And so now they're just in that 
within the right to say, folks, uh, we'd like to ask for the planning commission to take up a review. So my view is that if they wanted to expedite it and go to court, they would have gone to court already, I suppose, to bring it. They're not eligible to go to court yet on this on the action from October. Yeah. My, my, my concern as chair is that there has been information sent out to commissioners, some, they're not all, not universal across the table first of all. That's my, that's my concern, that is not equitable to those sitting at the table, that some has been sent out and not. Uh, so what was in that packet or what was not in that packet, I don't know what information was or was not included, I don't know, but as if everyone did not get it, that's my concern that it was not. Set equally. But at this point, as chair, I simply entertained the motion place of the date. Uh, we've had discussion. Any other discussion from commissioners? This was, a, uh, I'll just mention because I was at the well, last preservation board meeting. I don't believe I was. Randy, if I yeah, just make a point. One of the points, of, of the point I will make is as Randy's standing, he is unique above our membership here is he has a dual role in that he's both a member of the Preservation Board and a member of the Planning Commission. Right, and, um, and granted, I don't, I don't recall, I don't think I was at the very first time this, hit, this came to the Preservation Board, but I was at the last one in October, and if I recall, there may have been, a, the case may have been presented from a different angle the second time around, but, and maybe, and you might be able to clarify, but there was no really new information. It was the same set of circumstances, um, and that's why it just, yeah, I think that we, we had a unanimous vote that everyone voting felt that it just did not meet the criteria. So I'm not sure, unless there's something glaring, but if they're, if they're not able to present new information, I don't see how we're going to come to a, a different result. Um, and as, again, you know, it'd be a waste of, of everyone's time. That said, I really don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, so I'll go with the consensus. I would make the motion that we send it to the court and we don't take it. Second. Then moved and seconded that the action, action item is not taken up and returned back to the petitioner uh, as such. David, would you take the roll, please? Uh, Alderman Boyd. Nope. It's a no. Okay. Uh, Alderman Tom. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Banton. Nay. Commissioner Bowen. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Reed. No. Commissioner Vine? Aye. Commissioner Young? No. And Chair Strider? Aye. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six ayes. And one, two, three, four nays. So the motion passes. With that, the petitioner still has their own ownership and action not available to them. It is just not taken up before this commission at that point. So that's where we are with that. Thank you, members of the press. I mean, they're always challenging ones. Uh, of course, there's always items that might happen in the private marketplace or it might happen in court. Uh, we'll change gears now and do the Chapter 99 money studies that we're picking up this time. Cecilia will come and make a presentation on these. Uh, the first one is one of these large geographic areas that we do rarely. Uh, it's an all home and tones area. And, uh, I will tell you, uh, I want to do one thing as Cecilia gets ready, yeah. is that um, we, as you know, had a meeting last week, uh, and we prepared for this week, and we did a slightly different version of our resolutions than, than you see. Uh, it was a quick shorthand version uh, that had more graphics than text, uh, and we hope that was expedient and for you guys to see it. 
So you think we like pictures better? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a Crayola. Uh, Cecilia has uh, various software. And we know how you are with maps. Yes, John, we know. So uh, tonight we have uh, guests related to the remodel uh, plan. This particular one, we have an honored guest in the Shane Cone. It's a representative of this area. It doesn't have a specific developer because it's for a large geography, meaning it's been offered to us from LGRA uh, for our review, uh, and then, of course, goes on to the Board of Aldermen. In that regard, uh, three <coughs> members of SODC staff are here, including Otis, uh, and I'm going to ask Dale Rusak to make Cecilia is, well, we get to a couple maps just to have, oh, I have Dale talk about it a little bit because it is unique because it's a large, large redevelopment. Sure. So, um, that's pretty good. This is the Merrimack, South Thompson, South Grand State Street redevelopment area. So, there's a site map on the screen for you here. The uh, site is located within the Dutch Town, uh, Mount Pleasant, as well as the Tondaway neighborhood. The proposal uh, is to incentivize development in 290.65 acres, and then we'll go through the scoop and all of that in a little bit. So, Dale, there's two pages of maps, which is a full exhibit from your your we have all the plan. Would you like this one? Pardon? Would you like this one? Oh, well, maybe that would be helpful. <laughs> Down to the board. Oh, well, let's see, I mean, I mean that needs. But uh, this is the map, you know, of the area, and the map on the left is uh, primarily talking about the condition of properties. And generally speaking, the properties, and obviously it, it uh, varies from parcel to parcel, but generally the properties we've classified as fair, except for Cleveland High School, which is the large black area, and the theater, which is that little triangle. And we know for, each, for sure that both of those are in, in poor condition, so we've identified them that way. And the, the map on the right, um, most of the area clearly is residential, but there are several corridors where there's concentration of uh, commercial, in many cases just a corner commercial maybe on each block. And so those dark uh, spots are showing where the concentration of, of commercial uh, mixed-use kinds of buildings are within the area. So everything that's not shown black on the right map is either residential or is institutional. Because in addition to Cleveland High School, there are also uh, several churches within the area. Thank but you. There's one more. No, going back. Yeah, that's the other set of maps. What churches are you referring to? Well, the, the little... The little thing sticking up on on the left is kind of was there, uh, historically a church, right? What are you no, it's a it's an old school bought by a Buddhist monk. Well, whatever, yeah. yeah the old Scruggs Elementary. Thing. Yeah, whether what, whether you call that a church now, I don't know. But at any rate, I, I did. Perhaps that's not accurate. Um, and then this shows proposed land use, which is essentially uh, we see the uh, Cleveland High School as being perhaps some kind of mixed-use project, uh, and all the other uh, existing commercial would remain that way. But the primary focus of the plan is to preserve the area, to encourage its renovation, and on a parcel-by-parcel parcel, uh, basis to see renovation occur. So the plan would allow individual property owners to get real estate tax abatement if they do a significant recap of their properties, or it would allow a developer to come in and and take a portion of the area that uh, they are particularly interested in and have a more organized uh, renovation uh, of properties. And obviously, the Cleveland High uh, the Cleveland High School site would take a major developer to uh, do significant work there. It could be a lot of restoration, but there's also room within that area because of the athletic fields and all that there. Could even be new construction within that project. It's not anticipated that there'll be a master developer. No, could happen, but there's none on the horizon. And if an individual wants to do their own renovation and seek tax abatement, that's a process of application to LCRA. That's correct. Okay. 
then the one on the right is just partly important for public relations in the, that stating that there's no use of eminent domain in this uh, that's correct. Right. Yeah. The properties uh, cannot be acquired through the use of eminent domain as a result of this. Problem. And is it uh, correct, Dale, that in that boundary, the boundary common to all the maps, if somebody applies for a building permit, because one of the things that happens with uh, Chapter 99 is the, the ability to have some design controls. Will you get plans sent to you of all the Project. Correct. Uh, once, uh, if this is approved by ordinance, uh, this then goes into whatever record the building department has, and when a building permit is applied for within this area, uh, the ordinance will require that it be uh, sent to us for review before it's approved. <coughs> so that's predicated on one if they pull a building permit. That's correct. Which is a big hit in some cases. Well, it could well be. Um, I mean, we'd have no way of knowing if they don't pull Well, especially since I only have one building inspector that does all of the housing conservation inspections as well as property inspections and the like. So, and then in terms of a design review, what does that look like? Well, we're obviously. Does that go to you? Pardon? Does that go to you and yes. your staff? Yes. So I won't expect very much out of that. Then. Okay. It, it depends on what is proposed to a great extent. If it's an existing building, we would want to see the basic architecture of that building preserved. If it's a new construction, then we would want to see something that would fit into the neighborhood, but certainly not necessarily mimic the architecture of the neighborhood. Well, Professor Gordon, you have any for them? What prompted the boundaries of this? It's an area that we have discussed for a long period of time, and uh, it's a concentration of area that that could use a lot of activity, could use a lot of work, and uh, I think it was jointly uh, decided between us and the aldermen that this is a reasonable area to concentrate on. The genesis of the area was that there was a development team that was working on a master plan for the redevelopment of Cleveland High School and the surrounding area around it, and SLDC and their infinite with them. Uh, the development team never uh, how would you like me to put this out this? So essentially they did all of the work and this was the area that they started to create plans around and then they are no longer interested in doing the project because of some shenanigans in part of the city. So that's how the boundaries came into being. So before us uh, is now uh, and uh, the city government uh, has many branches, the executive branch and the legislative branch. Uh, we will make the determination and rec recommendation to you guys that we find this area blighted, that we find this to be in conformance, so Cecilia will fill, fill up the rest of the PowerPoint, to be in compliance with the strategic land use plan, and then with the establishment, if I get this right, Jim, this area will end these boundaries, regardless of the uh, past. Uh, somebody can come in and ask for the tax abatement, ask for the help of the city, uh, without the creation of Chapter 99. It's, it's, uh, it will be in place for this job. Is that in essence correct? Well, without the creation of the 99, I'm not quite sure what that means. Without. If there was not a redevelopment area here at Chapter 99, if somebody wanted to do some development and get them set up through the 99 Chapter well, they have to do an individual. They have to do an individual. But this, this, that's correct. They, they would not have to do it on an individual basis. So I'm assuming since this has your support, Shane, that has community support as well? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, what was the question? Very tepidly. That it has community support? Okay. Oh. Basically, I was told by the mayor's office that this is the only way that they're going to be able to support anything with Cleveland High School to get a developer in there now that they scared the other developer away. So SLBC told the mayor's office that this is the next step, which 
and full transparency, when I first got elected, this was also a first step that I was told by SLDC that we needed to do. It's basically a trick that they play with most of the freshman aldermen. You know, come in, we'll do a Chapter 99 that will create some incentives for people to come in and do projects in your ward. And then without any development team behind it, you know, it's just a you know, statement on a piece of paper by the part of the city. So because SLDC doesn't actually put resources into managing development within these area chapter 99 plans unless someone comes to the table and they don't actively seek out people to go to the table or come to the table. What they may do after they pass this, as I supported the Board of Aldermen, is uh, then put out an RFP and you know, hope in one hand and shit in the other and see which one gets killed first. Am I saying anything? I wouldn't say the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I will make two points. Um, one, there are refreshments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and two of us, all of us have our coffee day. Uh, so. yeah, I was going to you. Oh, uh, this is the use plan for the area. Which is mostly. It's mostly neighborhood preservation, some areas of institutional preservation, especially with the along Merrimack, and on the side, um, neighborhood commercial areas, uh, one spot of neighborhood development area, and a small area of business industrial preservation area. The plan includes four development objectives, which is to facilitate the redevelopment of the people's high school. So they're going to rehab existing commercial buildings along uh, major streets, facilitate residential and mixed use activity in redevelopment area, and facilitate residential development activity throughout through the use of micro and sub developers. With that, the uh, staff finds that this plan is in conformity with the strategic land use plan and the uh, gravel Justin historic neighborhood plan were applicable and recommended. <laughs> We have any more discussions for this you know, just curious. Um, is there a map of the vacant lots in, included in this area? Map of the vacant lots. Oh, there a lot. Is there a lot of vacant? There, not really. The orange area that was on the loop, um, so right in the middle of the area, that's a uh, vacant lot for the most part. Some there are some homes at the south end of the lot there. Um, but the entire north end is completely vacant and not by the city. Granted, the west side is like community you know, garden space now, but um, aside from that, there's you know, a few lots kind of dabbled throughout, um, but very few. Most of them are vacant buildings, to be honest. So I am curious, though, when you all went through, who did the survey? Or was there a survey? It was just kind of like by eye. <coughs> Most of the buildings in this area are vacant, or most of the buildings in the There's area? probably about a 20% vacancy rate in this area. Along the Virginia corridor, there's a, probably a 30% vacancy rate of buildings along the Virginia corridor. Do we have any photos of this area at all? No. We, so I'll look at map B1. It's conditions of properties as a map that was provided to us. So it's like, we said is making an average. Uh, we have the one photo that's in your packet, given our time, that's really an area photograph. <clears throat> we didn't independently go out and take photos. Is this, an, is this, a, this seems like a large area to blight. Is this normal or? We, we have areas in town that's 300 and some odd acres blighted to uh, individual parcels, but you don't see large areas like this very often. <coughs> This is actually a good tool to use, and it's probably more effective than doing the little single blights here and there. But I'd, uh, more helpful when you actually have a development team that's working on projects in that area. Otherwise, it's left to the micro developers, if you want to call them that, to use their resources to be able to come forward for tax and so on. So, Alder McComb, um, you talk about 30%, 25%, or whatever percent you use. What percent is owned by LRA? Very little. Very little? Yeah. I think at any given time, I have between maybe 30 and 50 LRA properties on 
in the war total. So what type of um, marketing will be done for this? So you anticipate maybe an RFP going out? And what I was told by the mayor's office is that uh, they're <laughs> – can I? Sure. Uh, we will accomplish the reinforcement of the jury. And I know the all is very disappointed about what happened previously, but we will uh, pull all, all our resources to try and do this in a, in a very uh, professional way. And so it will be an RFP, but, it, but we will uh, put a lot of energy behind trying to respond to And I would have said, just give me a just a thought of what that would look like. I mean, how that, how would you market that? How would you attract someone to? to so, uh, according to Steve Conway, this is the best project and the plan that city can put together for any developer in the history of the city of St. Louis. Um, Do you want to believe our little? Well, I guess I. I so, 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 so I think that what we will be doing is is trying to take advantage of some of the like he called them micro uh, uh, investors that are in, in that area, but also some of the others. But so there are a number of uh, entities that are working in the region. And I think what we want to do is to try and catch uh, some of the interest that is sort of national, uh, some of the energy there. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think we we were moving along, we, we thought that we had a path uh, forward with the, with the developer that the all uh, brought to the table. And, and the reason I'm <clears throat> asking this is it's not, I want to be generic, it's not just about this redevelopment plan, but I know there was a, a small scale redevelopment plan that is for Natural Bridge, mm -hmm. um, and so there's a little geographies where we do our stretch here and there. And the challenge, and I, and I hear all McCall's frustration is we do this and then we have no help, and it just we just do it as an exercise. Right. And it's real important to us as aldermen that there is someone at SLDC that's a champion as marketing. I mean, I know you have a real estate person over there, right? I know you have been staff too, but we have to make sure that we have enough staff that this is meaningful. And it just doesn't sit around for years to come and just collect dust kind of sort of. So I, I, I get on my, my soapbox and then we fund things ourselves without the help of the city for the most part. Right. And so we would appreciate any additional tools and funds to help us with that market. Right. And, and I appreciate that. So maybe that's the conversation that we need to have moving forward. I mean, I'm saying this in all sincerity. I'm not trying to put you on the spot about anything. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to think about the growth of the city of St. Louis and how we I'm use the tools and effectively. And, and, and I think our goal is uh, I always take the disappoint uh, all of them and things that we do and things that we do because of just lack of, lack, lack of resources or uh, uh, directions that are provided. Mm -hmm. so, uh, to pay to, pay to do that, and so what I uh, what we are going to do is to try and uh, make this uh, work, and use that as a, as a model for how we move forward. And let me ask you this: though. How do you see the planning department playing a role in this process with moving forward with this redevelopment plan? Well, I think that you know uh, we have a good. Uh, working relationship with planning, and I guess as the as things come up that you need to bring <coughs> back to the commission, or or if there uh, is an opportunity to work with one of, one of the you know, developers where we can use utilize planning assistance that they have, you know, that have the capabilities, they also suffer from lack of resources, and, and so uh, it's just uh, you know the ability to be able to get that done. And so I, I think those are where we would be working. Uh, a significant part of that is to be working with uh, potential developers who come with uh, plans. And, and this is probably part of a larger discussion, but <clears throat> Man, I'm, so, I'm going I'm to slow you down for a second. Okay. If you would, because and I do understand that the aldermen have a particular issue, of concern, and question yeah. with SLDC as a plan and, and, and larger plans. 
But in this particular case, we do. Want, I want to look at at this issue. No, I, I, I understand. I, understand. I don't want us to get too far off. The and I don't want to do that either. But I think it's important that the planning commission understands how they can play a role in developing the city of St. Louis overall, and that things come before the planning commission and we just vote on it. But you don't really have a big picture of how this stuff works. And then there's other things going on. So that I just want the city of St. Louis to be efficient in how we utilize the resources that we have. So that, I'm not trying to belabor no, anything, I, I, but I like teachable moments. No, and I appreciate that. I think maybe we should at some point have the other bodies come before the commission to have that larger discussion in, in broader sense so that we're not we're not isolated on one issue to talk about broader issues. Okay. Uh, I think we're we're in good space with, with the alderman serving on the commission for this particular space brings a special dynamic dynamic that we don't have normally. Uh, so I'm really interested in hearing, you know, uh, Commissioner Combs, you know, concern about this because this is his backyard, literally. Well, so Dale, Don, Otis, if if this gets passed by the Planning Commission Board of Aldermen, uh, does it negate? So right now there is no master developer, right? So in the past, we've talked about Chapter 99s with master developers, or you know, 353, you know, what have you. Depending upon you know what happens with Cleveland High School and who comes in, all that fun stuff. Would this negate in the future the opportunity to have a master developer for the Chapter 99 or a 353? Well, it certainly doesn't negate the master developer. I mean, you would be happy to have them. That sort of simplifies everything. Right. Could be somewhat but we would, to a 353. But we would have to amend we would have to amend the ordinance in that case. Or is there what's the process behind that? If there's a master developer that comes forward. Well, forward. yeah, I mean the process would be uh, as part of advertising for the public hearing, which is next week, we've also advertised for development. So in other words, we've we've done that uh, so, HUD hearing on Thursday. Yeah. This week. It, it, at the end yeah, I'm sorry, this week. At the uh, end of that, advertising. sorry, I'm sorry. At the end of that, uh, is, is also a request for developers, and that just satisfies whatever uh, legal requirements we might have for that. So tomorrow, a developer could come in, the developer, and submit a proposal if he would want to. And the likelihood of that happening is probably zero. And so right. I realize because I passed one of these along it's South Grand ten years ago. Years ago. I'm still waiting. Right. Right. So let me so knit a few things together, both facts, concerns, uh, worries, uh, attitudes, to say what we have here is this unique item that it's some 200 acres. It has a major building and facility on it, the Cleveland High School, that needs some attention and is getting attention from a number of ways. Um, it is going to be found to be in compliance with the strategic land use plan that you looked at. This is well, largely a residential area. It uh, will be, after this pass, blighted and with a redevelopment plan. That means, as Dale just said, the advertising uh, goes into effect, that people can come, be a developer, request assistance, tax abatement assistance, without going from scratch, either for Cleveland High School or a single family on one of these. That's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Second is I think Alderman Cohn mentioned that there's only, we only think there's two dozen, two dozen plus L LRA properties in this area. Those properties as of, as of the passage of this L LRA, the city will be able to market those saying, here's a property, here's your tax abatement package is available for that property. Those are steps that this is going to create. Otis is talking about ramping up that marketing and outreach, and uh, see what happens. We request your approval. So I will entertain a motion. I mean, I'll make the motion that we pop up the Chapter 99 blighting plan for the uh, Merrimack Grand Virginia Bates corridor. It's been moved and seconded uh, for the pass for the approval of this. On this blind report, David, would you call roll, please? Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Commissioner Banton. Aye. Commissioner Boyd. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye.
Commissioner Reeves? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Young? Aye. With that, and let me let me backtrack to what Commissioner uh, Jeff said. I think it is critical that we do find the time to have that have a master plan plan real for all of us, to, so that we, as we're going through items, we can we can hold up mentally in our own mind against what's been what's being done by LRA, what's being done by SLBC, what's being done by whoever else, so that we're not operating isolated and isolation. I think that is, I think that's a great opportunity to be creative. I think you're going to, you spoke to that last week talking about a plan and us working, you know, individuals on just thumbnail opportunities. Because one of the reasons why I should have mentioned this when I was moving the slide is not only will this work in conjunction with the sloop, which is the highest so we can do this check, is the Broadway Jefferson Historic Neighborhood Plan has been created by a tremendous amount of citizen work. We've adopted it. And its geography is a little different, but it's there to help guide SLBC and the recruitment effort and, and community support. Okay. Next item we have. So the next item on your agenda is the Lighting Planning Development Plan for the Cottage Avenue, North Taylor Avenue, Moffitt, and the Avenue scenario. We'll see the good uh, map on your screen now. The proposal is to construct a contemporary style home. This is an aerial of the site outlined in yellow. And the strategic land use plan designates this area as neighborhood development area. The development of the area is the most important home. And staff finds it to be in conformity with the strategic land use plan. Neighborhood development area that we and we'll have references. There's two brothers of the development firm that are doing this. They're enthusiastically supported by all and more. Uh, they weren't able to be here tonight. Lobster brothers. Lobster brothers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a name you'll remember. <laughs> Any discussion? Any reference to this? Uh, I'm just kind of curious. Does this OBC feel like there's a high likelihood that this is going to be a project that moves forward? Seems Okay. Based on the interaction with the brothers, they seem to have lots of energy and really want to get this done. I guess I initially uh, concerned was that they were trying to build uh, a home that may have been too expensive for this area, mm -hmm. but we, I guess, had some discussions with them, and I think they're locked in. <coughs> I mean, they feel they have the plan to go to two or three display houses, and hopefully they'll sell off of them. Maybe the playhouses might be more elaborate and they'll eventually find people that uh, would want to something similar, but maybe not quite so elaborate. But uh, uh, they... Uh, Is there a CDA support for the project? There's not, no. Are they going to speak it out? I got no indication that they plan on doing it. No, we've had some, some up discussions with them and they have not. Is there a site plan showing the proposed, you know, way out of the new development? Because it looks like an awfully large area for just 18 homes. Okay. Oh, there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question just about the lighting report. Um, this looks really familiar because I remember the end wrap from last Um There's a selling of wraps that is in RED. And just because this looks like the same report as we had for the project in Oliver last year and last week, rather last Monday, is there any way to get something that is a little more substantive? Substantive. <laughs> and I, I just don't know. We just kind of all, all this required for the report. This looks like exactly the same. Yeah, well, no, it's, it's the same basic form that's used for each project. Too. Well, and I think this is what's filled out is exactly the same wording because I see Enra again. <laughs> and, okay. and it's just, it's a very different situation in this project than it was in the project we saw last time. And usually when we have a little more time, we do an independent sort of look at it of our own cultures of other people. 
Okay. Yeah. 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 So what am I, the bottom picture on the left, what am I looking at? It looks like a garage. Well, that's the rear of a house, and uh, there, there are a number of different plans they have, but uh, the houses would be, the right hand is what essentially the house would, well, this, but they have several different models they want to build, but that's one of the models they want to build. So I'm just just to orient myself right there to the houses. So this model is this model. Is that, would that be correct? Mm -hmm. right. so this, is, this is the attached garage, right? Exactly, right. So this looks like a detached garage. Yeah, they have some of each. It looks like that. I think they, they well, the top, top third top one is. Phase two, phase two at the top, I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 So there's like three or four that have the garages to kind of offset, 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 I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I mean, and they're all conceptual. So. The sand buildings are existing buildings. A couple of them are occupied. A couple of them are unoccupied. Okay. So this will allow for their renovation. And so are, there, are there demos included in? No, the demo, they do not plan on demolishing those houses. Okay. So there's a existing conditions report by an area photograph. And then the next one, which is the strategic language plan. That color, to look at that orange, uh, as opposed to the yellow means that the neighborhood preservation area, the stable neighborhood area. Uh, orange means at the time when we were looking at this strategic land use plan, a good 50% of those blocks that are shaded orange was vacant at the time that we looked at this. So they were envisioned as being yellow is info opportunity. The orange is something available for a large-scale developer to do something. So here we have the Lobster Brothers looking at a large-scale development on that vacant site in the photograph and doing something creative uh, that's been able to pass muster with the other colleges. And, so, and what was the price point? The price, just the price point of these? Did they have those? Yeah, they were looking at like $350,000. Oh, wow. It was a large building. I suppose it was Right. So we're encouraging yeah, yeah. to, to develop some of it at lower end, and I think what I was Are all of these to be built on double lots? Yeah. So what's the reason for the such wide spacing? They definitely wanted them to be on substantial lots, no question about it. And is there all of them was very supportive of that idea. The, the thought was that there's nothing like that available in the area where you could actually have a house on, you know, like a 60-foot lot, and they wanted to provide that opportunity. Well, I'm curious, from the planning department's perspective, is the goal to suburbanize the city with huge um, lots? Uh, <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, aren't you no, taking away? Not my exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Tired of forced into people people believing because there are those suburban houses that the planning department is in support. Well, it's not the, just okay. the design; it's the size of the lot. Um, and the good news is, I've been here 30 years. I'm not going to be here much longer. It's just that's stupid for me to be here much longer. So you've been saying that for since well, 20 years. For 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the problem that is, Part of that that is, I'm here as a bad guy, because I don't have money to give anybody. I just have to give You will notice, I anyway, just digress, Patrick Sandel is, uh, we're the planning and urban design agency, uh, but we call ourselves PDA for two reasons. One, say Puda out loud, it sounds pretty bad. 
Yeah. Uh, and two, we know we're urban. So we're trying to make sure that we, we treat people as being urban. This particular ward, the, the fourth ward in the neighborhood, the Ville neighborhood, worked on a lot along Dr. Martin Luther King, worked on a lot. There are over 500 vacant parcels by vacant buildings or, 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 or vacant lots in the, in the fourth ward. And that's a large concentration. So the, the historic district, as I, I mentioned, is we're really policing the historic district for, for things that are compatible. But then there are some opportunities where to try to find the pump to do something. To do something. So there will be no opportunities to build in between those houses if this is all built out. So the lots will stay as. Unless they well, divide the lot and sell it off, people make some more lots. Right. Yeah, the market, that market will dictate that because right now there's still a conceptual. Well, it's saying, are they going to be able to sell a three hundred fifty thousand dollar lot? And we have a we have big, there's big F for sure. For sure. Okay. So, so the answer is, uh, like we've got said, the price get high. We'll see how it comes. But uh, I yeah, yeah. Well, you, but you also don't want to have them in a position where they think they can do it and then they fail, and then we're back to kind of what we were saying was there earlier. It, it looked real good on paper at the beginning, and then we end up with, with nothing down the line. Okay. Do they own the lots right now? I don't know. They have options. Yeah, they have options. Yeah, I'm, 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 is it LRA? Yeah, LRA. Okay. Tell the truth. And people are liking people speaking the truth. Uh, we had a meeting last week on Monday night. Uh, we hurriedly got our materials for you. We were a little hurried in getting materials for you. I apologize for that. I'm pained by that. I am frustrated by that. I don't like it. Any further discussion on 16-19 RDM, the lobsters plan? Motion to approve. Second. It's previous row. Call for previous row. Objection. Objection. Okay. Objection. Okay. With that, we need a roll call, please. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Cohn. Aye. Commissioner Batman. Nay. Commissioner Bowes. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. No. no. Commissioner Reed? Aye. Commissioner Vine? I'm going to say no. Uh, Commissioner Young? Aye. And Chair Strother? Aye. And the motion passes with seven ayes and three. Well, Mr. Senior goes on. No, I will tell you that we have two more redevelopment plans to do yet tonight. And that the principals involved in both of them are here and I've heard on prior discussions. So <laughs> <laughs> you want to just show that this one straight to the Great to the left. You'll not find the next two to be too severe. No, I don't think you'll find yeah. the next two to be too severe. Did you learn how to get a man earlier to get higher on the agenda? <laughs> I, I, I think you will find the next two as being responsive to polite and doing things for you. Know, so <laughs> Development plans for the Belt Avenue Sunrise Avenue Delmar Boulevard, also known as the I 469 Delmar Boulevard. These sites are in the same now. This is in the Sunrise Boulevard. This is now the draft of the site outlined in yellow. On the screen now are the day and nighttime renderings of the proposed development. These are to make modifications to the existing structure to allow for mixed use of providing residential and commercial uses, including office space, shared service, and other resources for nonprofit and community organizations. Mm -hmm. You see those as existing buildings. Yes, those are existing. The completed land use plan designates the various opportunity areas. Given that the opportunity area designation is flexible and this is a large development proposed to Transform the existing vacant structures to a usable and valuable mixed use. PDA finds that this plan is in conformity with the city of plan opportunity area and recommends approval. The developer's representative is here for Kelsey. And, and, <laughs> because he's here, uh, you're free to ask him any questions, but I'd like Craig to just give a little speed about what's going on. 
Correct. Okay. Um, thank you. <coughs> you may have heard of this is Delmar Divine. It's the old the work of the old uh, St. Luke's Hospital complex. Um, Delmar Divine is, uh, as you mentioned, a mixed use project, um, social innovation project that is uh, a mix of, of um, moderately priced uh, market rate apartments, 150 of those, along with um, uh, a co-location facility for nonprofits. So it's you know, kind of a cortex for nonprofits where EJ agencies can come together um, and hopefully get the benefits of, benefits of co-location, but also uh, by being in close proximity, we'll be able to work together, be more innovative and collaborative, um, and then therefore be able to make a bigger impact in the region helping uh, folks in, in need. Um, so uh, we got involved. Uh, this has got a lot of support from Washington University and others. So uh, Bob Clark got involved a couple years ago and, and agreed he saw the merits of it and what it could do for the region and agreed to be the, uh, uh, the get it developed. Um, it's not a typical PLACO or CG, CRG project, but uh, it's one that we feel is uh, important for the region. And it's not an easy project to pull off. Uh, it's going to be very expensive. It's about a half a million square feet as it's up there today. Um, uh, it's a gut rehab, so you have gut rehab type cost. Um, nonprofits don't, of course, can't afford a lot in in uh, rent, so uh, there's not a lot. The budget can't afford a lot of debt. So um, we're being creative, using every incentive we can to uh, to make it work, along with a large capital campaign. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it'll be a great thing for the, uh, the West End. It'll hopefully uh, spur more development north of Delmar, uh, and more importantly, be able to really uh, have these nonprofits go uh, get more done. Okay. Mr. Sean? Any questions before I end? Tell me, tell me what moderately priced looks like. So moderately priced, um, you know, if you were this, if these were low income and developed with the low income housing tax credit, um, the resident would have to make only 50 or 60 percent of the median income. Um, so a single person living in a one bedroom, for instance, would be able to make 30, 31 thousand a year. If they made a little over that, then they they couldn't get into the unit. Um, we're trying to have uh, workforce price housing uh, where um, they could, the, the, the resident there would make a little more than that. Um, like a school teacher or a social worker making thirty-five, maybe $40,000, uh, they're not going to afford a lot of the new apartments that people are developing and charging a buck. Uh, $82 to you know, more a foot. Mm -hmm. uh, these are more like $1.45 to $1.50 a foot. So, um, you know, we, we want to have a product there that we think is in need, uh, but not use the low income credit where we would restrict it. So, um, for housing, for housing, if somebody comes along and makes a lot of money and wants to live there, that's not <coughs> market rate based. Market rate, but we're uh, purposely trying to keep it low. Um, the facility, what we feel in need is. And what percentage of the space do you think the nonprofit will actually work What percentage of that whole project? Well, the, there's um, the first phase of commercial is about uh, 150,000 gross square feet of commercial, is 110 or so leasable. So there's a lot of shared spaces. There'll be a co working facility and all that there. So that, when I say, Kitchen areas, break areas, conference rooms, training centers, a little auditorium. Uh, should be a real resource for not only the folks who uh, locate there, but also for the neighborhood that comes to use. Okay. And I'm going to ask a question because I'm missing a link here. Okay. The interest that Maxine Clark and Bilderberg have in this with Clay Cove, am I missing a, 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 a bridge between the two of them? I don't think it's a bridge. This was kind of Maxine had this idea. Um, you know, as you can imagine, Maxine isn't a real estate developer, so this, this is a good, this is potentially all in a hundred and hundred million dollar project, so it's not a good place to start as far as being a real estate developer. That's why the folks at WashU are able to get in, uh, 
Bob, uh, Bob Clark. There's no relation there between Maxine and Bob. That, I guess that's what I was trying to tell. Yeah. Is there any tunnels or bridges that we're missing? No, no. Maxine is, uh, is you know, founder of Build-A-Bear and yeah. now retired, but she spends uh, uh, her retirement years working in these agencies and found that a lot of them were, you know, they're, they're all very hardworking, uh, well-intentioned people, but they tend to work in their silo, they head down and they got their mission and they're out about it, but they they could get more done if they if they knew what others were doing. They could work together better. Any other commissioner questions? Before Don speaks, we'll be ready to jump in. He's jumping at the building, see. So, so there are community spaces in this facility that will be open to the rest of the community? And is that, what type of spaces are those again? Well, it's, it's um, you know, if there's all of these sharing spaces. There will be places where the neighborhood groups can come and have meetings. There will be like, um, there will be a lot of the neighborhood <coughs> collection to provide services here too. That's important. But then also there will be like um, organizations doing computer training, skills training, and all kinds of things. This, you know, for us, it's developing the real estate to make sure we get the real estate rights of the cultures right. But just as Cortex is ongoing programming, constantly evolving to do more and yeah. reach needs. This is very similar here. And WashU has uh, stepped up and will be putting money uh, into the project, but also will be there long term to help with the Brown School and other things that are doing there. Make sure that yeah. the programming and the operation is responsible. Awesome. Question right? for Dale. <clears throat> Dale, in a real simple way, explain to me when it's tax when the property is tax exempt, which this is correct. It has been in the past. It's currently tax exempt, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, it's it's LCRA owned. Okay. And with the hospital or whatever. Right. 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 Exactly. So, so it's probably never been on the tax roll. Okay. So the, the the redevelopment plan calls for, you know, support of tax abatement. It says five percent of what it explain this language in here, not the five percent. Well, when it is no longer tax exempt, the, the assessor will put a, a value on it. Okay. And it will begin paying taxes. Uh, but if say the assessor says it has to pay a hundred thousand dollars in tax. Mm -hmm. So it's in the tax exempt except for five percent of that. They'll have to pay. So five percent of that will go to all the taxing districts. Okay. So the other ninety-five percent will be tax abated for okay. a period of years while all the loans and tax abated. Yes. So they could put some kind of value on it. Yeah, I mean they will. They will put some value on it. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic, wonderful project. Began as an LCRA SOBC RFP. There we go. Bring it all back around, Don. That's pretty quite this way. On that note, I will entertain any motion. Second. second. Is the move and seconded? The call for roll, please. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Cook. Aye. Commissioner Bannon. Aye. Commissioner Boyd. Aye. Commissioner Bradley. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Aye. Commissioner Reese. Aye. Commissioner Bynes. Aye. Commissioner Young. Aye. Commissioner Strother. Aye. Motion passes with all present voting. Aye. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Commissioner Reese, please forgive me. Normally I do call you by name to see if you have any questions. Uh, so the, your name tag's on my site, so I will remember that next time. <laughs> One more action item. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, last item on your agenda is uh, Blighting Study and Redevelopment Plan for 200 North 4th Street. Redevelopment area, the site map can be seen on your screen now. It is 2.15 acres. This is an aerial photograph of the site outlined in yellow. The proposal is to renovate an existing commercial building, which currently includes 440 hotel rooms. It will be uh, it would be converted into retail space, 186 hotel rooms, 96 time shares, 160 apartments, and would have 574 parking spaces as well. The cost of the project is expected to be approximately 30 million. The strategic land use plan designates this area a specialty mixed use area. 
and give it to the special team if it's area designation and we kind of see where mixed abuses coexist and drive together to solve the proposal aim to transform this hotel into a mix of uses and PDA staff finds that it conforms to the strategic land use plan at MUA designation and recommends approval. The developer is missing representatives right here. Hi, my name is David Sweeney, uh, attorney for Hello. the developer Inner Circle from Florida. Uh, as laid out earlier, um, this is taking a lot of apartments, excuse me, a lot of hotel rooms and bringing that footprint down significantly. Um, it's bringing a whole new sec section um, with the vacation rental. Diamond Resorts is the company that's doing that. You may have seen them in the community the last year um, at public events. They have invest invested a significant amount of money into building that up. Um, we've talked with Katie Radcliffe. She's very excited to bring in a whole different set of tourists that we normally want to see. It's really Diamond Resort's first foray into the urban setting. Typically, mm. them on Las Vegas, on the beaches, different places like that, Florida, obviously. Um, uh, this project also truly is a mixed use. You also have apartments as well as uh, a significantly smaller number of hotels. Did the uh, 300 and plus odd million dollars investment in the arch grounds cause any attractiveness? Absolutely. I think the support of, of St. Louis are folks that aren't from here, myself included, um, and we appreciate what we have. Um, they're very interested not only in this site, but also some very tall buildings right around it that they're looking at, um, as well as some other projects. So um, they see the potential in St. Louis. And, Really promoting this. What hotel was there previously? Brown Plaza. It's been a, few, uh, oh, it's been a bunch of different okay. things. Okay. Uh, it's, been, it's been solely uh, branded currently. Got so, Commissioner Vice, please. Oh, I was just going to ask. Um, I think it says you know, in the agenda and the uh, whatever you have here for the record. Um, it's not going to alter the exterior of the building. Not, not at all. They'll be going after historic tax credit, but they won't be able to. There was a plan floated for one of those mansion house buildings, some you know, like ten years ago, we were going to renovate and brick up, no. make it look ridiculous. Absolutely they not. Like that. They, for, that, for that building, for sure, I can speak to. That won't. That is not thought at all. Uh, yeah. So, uh, excuse my ignorance for not knowing a lot about the legalities about timeshares and stuff, but. Say, I don't you know, not saying, hoping this happens, but say the timeshare thing doesn't work out. Is that going to in any way hamper a potential, the next redevelopment of this building, should that come around? I mean, they're uh, in a contract with them. So this isn't an LOI or anything else. So um, it's okay. going to happen for a short number of years, not for the whole time. Oh, okay. But, um, they're making a significant investment. Like I said, I mean, if you go to the Billikens game, the Cardinals game, it's not cheap to be in the concourse in four locations. Um, the Blues game, they have time. So they're, they're really, I mean, as we all know, but a lot of other people don't know, once they're here, they've already paid for it. So they, they're coming with money to spend bluntly. And also, the great thing about St. Louis, not only being in the middle of the country, is, is with families, there's so much stuff to do, very inexpensively, if not free. So it's definitely another benefit to get folks to come. And, and, and to Don's point about the arch improvements, and the, as we all, as everyone knows, the arch is totally different now, somehow. I don't know how they did it, but the experience is totally different. <laughs> <laughs> Not a, $300 million. Yeah. <laughs> That's how they did it. <laughs> they do a whole bunch of things. I mean, I hear it's good. Yeah, it's been closed now. But, uh, but they tried to break it up. <laughs> Very different too. Oh. So, Dave, I'm trying to add these numbers up. So, they where I'm going off with the math. So, currently it's 440 hotel rooms. So, they're going to reduce that to 186 hotel rooms, 96 timeshares, and 160 apartments. I come up with 442. So, they're, they're going to one and a half. cut something. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, so, so, because I hate timeshares, I'm stuck with one. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. They make a lot of money. Well, time you're, you're going to reduce yourself because of that. I appreciate it. I, I, I absolutely would <laughs> not. If you have a interest. But I'm curious as to how they do their run their numbers on those timeshares. Because that, because 52, 
So you have everyone put them. Fifty two owners for a year <laughs> times ninety six. You're just looking at thirty million dollars seem to be kind of cheap. But that was not what we were talking about. But that seems to be a low ball number to do all this stuff on doing. Is it going to be a low budget timeshare, of course? No, I think the opposite. I mean, timeshares have changed a lot from what I've read about the industry and everything else. I mean, they're not taking anybody. I mean, really? the less economic downturn so. financially, it made no sense. And people, so they want people with good credit scores. You clearly are a better credit chief than I am, all of them. So I don't know if I'm going to do that. I doubt 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 out of, out of fairness, Commissioner Reese, is there any questions from you? No, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> any other questions from the commission? Hearing none. So oh. one, just one. So this is the first urban project that you, that this company is doing. Are you aware of any other projects like this anywhere across else in the country? City. No, Saturn Resort is one of the like two, three biggest book players in that. What you are seeing as far as the timeshare world goes, and I think this kind of shows it coming more mainstream, every hotel brand has their own timeshare now. I don't know if people are, like the Weston brand, Marriott, they're all getting in that space and using their current hotel living coffin in that or eating room. So um, you're seeing most of them, even like a, a Four Seasons type place, they have something that would fall under vacation. <laughs> Dave, did you realize um, on those timeshares, how many owners vacation it would be? Vacation rental. 4,992 owners. <laughs> 52, if you say one person that buys a week, that's 52 owners times 96 rooms. 4,992 owners, potential. That's incredible. So maybe you're in the wrong place. I'm going to have to hang out with Dave Sweeney. I'll yeah. tell you that and learn something yeah. here. But someone with a really good credit score might take two weeks. That's right. Yeah. But we still count on them. Those are all thousands of visitors that we may yeah. not get. And I think that's a great And thing. it works. I've used them going yeah. stay in a hotel versus staying in a resort somewhere. So it works. Okay. Can we get previous role on this one? Yes. Hearing no objections to previous role. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Board, for this lobby today. <laughs> With that, the previous role is approved. No, you are other other business to do other than see you on February 6th, and uh, I think the next few months will be boring compared to the last ten. So we don't have to give a month because we had two and a month. <laughs> oh. You want to give us any background on why we had refreshment for the four Is there any particular reason? Should we expect this from now on? People are coming back. All right. Yeah. So, so. With, I just as generous I bought them. Thank you, Doc. With that, any there's no new business right here. Most of the close meeting. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much.